Hello and good evening. I'm Jessica Strand, the Director of Public Programming at the Library Foundation of Los Angeles, a nonprofit that provides vital support to the Los Angeles Public Library. The Library Foundation also presents public programs like this one, covering a myriad of subjects from some of the great thinkers of our time. As a Director of Programming for the Library Foundation of Los Angeles, I am proud to be involved in supporting a library thus all libraries across the country who have to provide education, access to information, literature, and support to all communities across this nation. Tonight, we are honored to be presenting Lift Every Voice, a year-long nationwide celebration of 250-year tradition of African-American poetry, which is directed by the Library of America in partnership with Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. Please welcome Max Rudin, the president and publisher of the Library of America. Thanks, Jessica. Thanks very much. Um, hi, I'm Max Rudin, uh, president and publisher of Library of America, the nonprofit organization dedicated to publishing authoritative new volumes of great American writers and to keeping the many voiced American literary tradition a vital part of the culture. As, as Jessica said, tonight's program is part of Lift Every Voice, a, a nationwide celebration of the tradition of African-American poetry. With signature events this past September in New York, uh, Atlanta in October, Chicago in November, Los Angeles tonight and next Kansas City, plus readings, performances and conversations in public libraries around the country, a revelatory new anthology, brilliantly edited by Kevin Young, and a new website and media archive, africanamericanpoetry.org, with more resources to explore. Lift Every Voice aims to highlight the richness and diversity of African-American poetic imagination and its central place in American poetry. Uh, Lift Every Voice, as Jessica said, is directed by Library of America, uh, Library of America in partnership with the Schomburg Center uh, and with libraries, arts organizations, and bookstores in all, in all 50 states. It is supported with grants from three funders to whom we are deeply grateful, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, and Emerson Collective. In momentous times, great poems speak to us with new profundity. Deep calls unto deep, as the psalmist says. We hope Lift Up Your Voice can be a source of discovery, renewal, and joy. Thank you. And thank you to Jessica and the Library Foundation of Los Angeles for their partnership this evening. Thank you, Max, so much. Um, I want to just quote uh, Kevin Young, as he says so poignantly in his introduction to the anthology, quote, the African American experience these poets know is a central part of the nation's chorus with black poetry offering up a daily epic of struggle and song. End of quote. I'd like to introduce the artists that we are honored to feature this evening. These brief bios are just snippets uh, of the incredible work they've done in their careers. In order of their appearance this evening, we begin with Kevin Young, uh, the editor of this marvelous anthology that we're celebrating this evening. He is the director of the Smithsonian's National Museum of the African American History and Culture and the poetry editor of The New Yorker. Before his new position, he served as the director of the New York Public Library's Schomburg Center for Research and Black Culture. He's the author of 13 books of poetry and prose. He is the editor of nine other volumes, including the anthology African American Poetry, 250 Years of Struggle and Song. He is also the Chancellor of the Academy of American Poets. Robin Cost Lewis is the Poet Laureate of Los Angeles and a writer in residence at the University of Southern California. Her poetry debut, Voyage of the Sable Venus, was honored with the 215 National Book Award for Poetry. The first poetry de debut to do so since 1975, and the first debut to win in poetry by an African American. Lewis is a Cave Cannon Fellow, a Fellow of Los Angeles Institute for the Humanities, a Ford Foundation 
Art of Change Fellow. She was a finalist for the Rita Dove Poetry Award, the Los Angeles Times Book Prize, the Hurston Wright Award, as well as the International War Poetry Prize. Lewis's work has been widely published in journals and anthologies such as the New Yorker, the Paris Review, and the New York Times. Chris Bowers is a Grammy-nominated, Emmy Award-winning, and Juilliard-educated pianist and composer. Bowers has established himself at the forefront of Hollywood's emerging generation of composers, having scored numerous projects, including Green Book, When They See Us, Bridgerton, Bridgerton Miss America, and many more. He has also performed and collaborated with Jay-Z. Sophia Sinclair is the author of Cannibal, which was selected as one of America Library Association's notable books of the year and winner of numerous awards, including the Whiting Writers Award, the American Academy of Arts and Letters, Addison M. Medcalf Award, and numerous others. Sinclair's other honors and fellowships include the Pushcart Prize, a Ruth Lilly and Dorothy Sargent Rosenberg Fellowship from the Poetry Foundation, among others. Her poems have appeared in countless journals and periodicals, including Poetry, Granta, and The Nation. And her forthcoming memoir, How to Say Babylon, will be published by Simon & Schuster. And finally, our last performer, at 22, Amanda Gorman is heralded as, quote, the next great figure in American poetry, end of quote. America, uh, Amanda made history in 2017 by being named the first ever youth, national youth poet laureate in the United States. Since publishing a poetry collection at 16, her writing has won her invitations to the Obama White House and to perform most recently at the inauguration of Joseph R. Biden, the 46th president of the United States. She has spoken at events and venues across the country, including the Library of Congress and Lincoln Center. In the coming weeks, she'll be the first poet to perform at the Super Bowl. In September, this year, Amanda's children's book, Change Sings, and another book of poems will be, will be released. Please welcome Kevin Young. Thank you very much. Hi, Kevin, how are you? Hi, Jessica, thanks Thank for that. You. Thank you for being here. I'm looking thanks forward for to this us. wonderful program. Thank you. Uh, me too, me too. Thanks to you, Jessica, and thanks to Max as well. Uh, not just for tonight, but for uh, being a stalwart editor uh, over the years. And uh, this anthology, as you may know, took six or seven years to do. And um, it was very much something that uh, kept me going to think about what the state of Black poetry is in America. And uh, the state, as you may have heard from just those introductions of other folks, is very rich. And um, I thought I'd start by reading a few poems. Um, this is from an ancestor uh, in the book. His name is Fenton Johnson. He was a Chicago poet. Um, and he wrote the first prose poems uh, published uh, in, by an African-American. He was a modernist. Uh, this was in the 19 teens, so over 100 years ago. He was writing these poems uh, from a series that got called once African Nights. So this is the first and the most famous of these poems. It's called Tired. And what I want you to listen for is sort of the blues feeling that he's capturing even before Langston Hughes a decade later would write in the blues form. Tired. I'm tired of work. I'm tired of building up somebody else's civilization. Let us take a rest, Melissa Jane. I will go down to the last chance saloon drink a gallon or two of gin, shoot a game or two of dice and sleep the rest of the night on one of Mike's barrels. You will let the old shanty go to rot, the white people's clothes turn to dust and the Calvary Baptist Church sink to the bottomless pit. You will spend your days forgetting you married me and your nights hunting the warm gin Mike serves the ladies in the rear of the last chance saloon throw the children into the river. 
civilization has given us too many. It is better to die than it is to grow up and find out that you are colored. Pluck the stars out of the heavens. The stars mark our destiny. The stars marked my destiny. I am tired of civilization. So that's a lot of the struggle, I think, that the book thinks about and, and some of the song. Um, but I thought I'd read one more poem from the anthology uh, and then a poem of my own. This poem is called Infirm. It's by the late, great Gwendolyn Brooks. That first poem was by Fenton Johnson. Uh, and what I love about this poem by Brooks is it, in its admission of pain or struggle, it creates a song, it creates a prayer, it creates a place to go, uh, a reclamation, if you will, infirm. Everybody here is infirm. Everybody here is infirm. Oh, mend me, mend me, Lord. Today I say to them, say to them, say to them, Lord, look. I am beautiful, beautiful with my wing that is wounded, my eye that is bonded, or my ear not funded, or my walk all a wobble. I'm enough to be beautiful. You are beautiful too. Uh, and I, the poem I have in the anthology is rather long. So I was gonna read one poem from a book called Brown. Um, <clears throat> it's uh, for the late, uh, recently passed away, Henry Aaron, um, who I, the poem knows that uh, he was, uh, he called himself Henry Aaron, uh, but of course he's better known or most often known as Hank Aaron. Uh, and the poem has to know that, it doesn't have to speak that, uh, but it, it mentions some of his other nicknames, Bad Henry uh, and other things. Um, but I'm just gonna read part of it uh, so we can move into hearing from Robin and others. It's an open letter to Hank Aaron. The hate mail you quit opening kept coming, scrawled or sutured, brushing you back more than a Hoot Gibson inside pitch, no return address. The newspaper with your obit already written, primed to run. Still, you swung like a boxer in the late rounds, hoping to change the judges' minds. Once you connect, and the ball barely sails over the short porch and left. You don't so much run as pace around the bases, nonchalant, nervous, a man with too much cash worrying his pockets, a windfall he may never live long enough to spend. Rounding second, two guys race up to you, friend or foe, clapping you on the back. I hear they're doctors now, as if you just been born. Hopping the fence like that ball did, your mama bear hugs you, headed home. Think of it as money, the bank card billboard you cleared and left peeled says. Not that you did. After, the microphones aimed at your face like arrows into a saint. Your face less belief than relief. I just thank God, you say, it's over with falling back into the crowd, unharmed, you wave your blue arms. So that was a little tribute to Henry Hank Aaron. Um, he meant so much to me as a young person growing up and knowing you could achieve um, and wanting to turn that into poetry, which I think is a, a impulse that you see in the anthology, one of honoring, of, of thinking of the ancestors, um, but also thinking of the struggle that is underneath the song. Uh, one of the experts in such things is Robin Costa Lewis, who it's my pleasure to bring on now. Uh, you've heard her bio. I'm happy to uh, call her friend as well as uh, one of my favorite poets. So, uh, Robin. I'm coming. <laughs> uh, so good to Hi. see you. Hi, darling. Oh. How are you doing? I'm doing really well. I'm actually very emotional by the made very emotional by this whole event. I'm really honored to be yeah. here, Kevin. And um, those poems you just read were stunning. A lot of people don't know this, but Kevin's one of the people that um, 
I read uh, while I was thinking about if I should ever throw my hat into the ring for poetry. And it was your historical project and your early books that I would read and go, I didn't know, I didn't know you could do this. Um, thank you. So uh, yeah, thank you for always lighting the way for so many of us, Kevin. Thanks so much. I, so we're Maybe gonna have Emily so. Well, go ahead. No, go ahead. I'm just turning Maybe the Maybe that's a good place to start is because I just want to chat for a while. Um, sure. Is thinking about history in poetry and do you, what do you think the relationship of the tradition, the black tradition is to history in that way? You know, um, before we go, I also wanted to start talking. I also wanted to just invite the audience to congratulate, join me in congratulating you on your new post as the director of the National okay. Museum of African American History and Culture at the Smithsonian. So audience, it is a huge deal. The, the, the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture is a huge deal. Um, and then for Kevin to be named the director, I'm just, I'm verklempt. Um, so your question as to the history, the intersection. Yeah, well, obviously I, I care about history both in poetry and in museums. Right, um, exactly. What do you think I thought about I was it? supposed to be interviewing you. <laughs> Not interview. We're having I'm not a conversation. Let that happen. You think okay, I'm gonna let I wanna, that happen? I, want, I have questions prepared. In this for you. economy. Yeah. <laughs> all right. All right. Um, so, you what's can, your question? My question about we'll, history, but we can, you can, you know, ask me. No, and, no, go ahead, sweetheart. Go ahead. No, I'm just curious about your views of history, and then please let's let's do it your way. Sure, though. sure. You know, I think that uh, history is a myth first and foremost. Mm. What we know of as history. Mm -hmm. And as a little girl growing up as an African-American born in the 60s, you learn that early on because you have your lived life with your family. And then you go to school and you read these textbooks and there are no black people, no, no uh, indigenous people, no Asian people, no Latino people, nothing. Right. This I'm talking about my generation. When yeah. I went to school, it was possible to go from kindergarten to 12th grade. I never was given a person of color to read. Yeah. And so this whole fantasy, this American fantasy like democracy of history uh, mm. is, is deeply suspect to me and always has been uh, okay. because my lived life just cut right across it, right? And my father, think, remember my, I'm sorry, my father used to tell me the story about Eisenhower when he was in World War II and Eisenhower was notoriously racist. In fact, mm. Eisenhower was a person that gave the a word that Patrice Lumumba should be assassinated, right, as president, but as a general, you know, he was notoriously racist. Even on the day the war ended, Eisenhower sent out a telegram that said, black Yanks were not allowed to celebrate with white Yanks. This, this man went on to become our president. So history is, is a complicated fantasy for me. Well, I think what's interesting for me in the anthology about history is that it, in a way, is a history book. It tells exactly. the kinds of uh, points exactly. of view of history that I think are really interesting. Exactly. It celebrates uh, certain people uh, who weren't always celebrated when they were alive. Um, you know, exactly. someone like Emmett Till, uh, it almost, I almost had to limit the Emmett Till poems in the book because uh, there were so many poets responding to Emmett Till's uh, assassination, his murder. Um, right. And the po what's so powerful for me about the African American History Museum, uh, the Museum of African American History and Culture, is the way that, you know, Emmett Till's casket is there, you know, it is physically there. Uh, and in a way, you queue up much like um, people did in Chicago in the cold to see uh, him, uh, you it's know. Fine. Yeah. All right. And, you know, to me that that is so powerful and poetry is the place mm -hmm. I think that recreates that kind of monument that kind of moment. Absolutely. Uh, and Absolutely. people like Brooks, who I think were some of the finest poems uh, about Till, which are in the book, but even people today, uh, like Eve Ewing, who has a terrific poem about seeing him in the grocery store, Emmett Till, and, and what yes. it means to to encounter yes. these ancestors as living uh, yes. people. Uh, and I think that's important. Yes. Anyway, isn't you go ahead. Magic? Isn't uh, ten quick questions? For you, but isn't that the magic of Black poetry, Kevin, with regard to history? Right. It completely uh, upends the fantasy of a fixed narrative of fact because well, I, I think the facts about our lives and our history have been completely, you know. Yeah. I mean, to me, I, I think what I set out to do in a way, uh, and I think the book 
does this, I hope, is it questions all the aspects of its title. It, you know, it questions what exactly. African American exactly. means, what American means, but also what yes. poetry is. You exactly. know, you've heard those prose poems uh, from, you know, 1918. And, and, you know, you have to recalibrate our notion Absolutely. of what the tradition is. Uh, and I really want to include the kind of experimental tradition, which, um, you know, each of us in different ways has participated in, I think. And, sure. you know, uh, in some way, as I say in the introduction, any effort of Black poetry was kind of an act of resistance. And yes, so much yes. of that resistance is tied to, to me to joy and pleasure, yes. but it isn't pleasure, uh, you know, abstract from uh, the struggle. You know, the song right. includes the struggle. And one of the things I love about the blues, and I think one of the things the blues tone in, in a way in both those poems is, is a kind of resistance just by naming pain in order to get past it. You know, and when Absolutely. you hear blues songs or when I listen to Brooks or, or even read Fenton Johnson saying, you know, throw the children into the river. I mean, what a what an intense uh, moment of feeling Absolutely. for this persona he's created. And him say, you know, I can reject civilization. I can become uh, my own person. I'm tired. You know, yes. <laughs> that's tired yes. for you. Yes. Uh, and you, you know, we've all in different ways experienced that. And I, I think having that pain named is so uh, powerful. It was an amazing line that from that prose poem by him that you read that said, I am tired of civilization, right? Yeah. It's incredible. And I love what you're saying too about, you know, how early on that he wrote these prose poems in the 19 teens, when we're just, so many people are just starting to read prose poems. And that's something I always want to celebrate about Black poetry. And you do so, so well and the choices you've made in the anthology, you know, like we were modern before, <laughs> during colonialism. Them, you know, like we were like <laughs> sure. completely, um, you know, strutting in a very modernist fashion. Well, and it's just so one. amazing. It's so amazing to see it here because now people are going, oh my God, this person is doing this and that's great. They are. But what's really even more heartening to me is that there's this profoundly long legacy of people doing just that. So as to my questions, let's see. First of all, thank you. Doesn't do justice to this Herculean project and treasure. Um, I just can't get over the magnitude of it all. Um, before we begin, though, in terms of these questions, uh, I wonder if you can tell the audience briefly about the politics and history quickly of what an anthology is, because not everybody reads anthologies, Kevin. So I wonder if you can just briefly say what role the Black Poetry Anthology has played. Yeah, I mean, I think Black Poetry Anthologies, uh, and I talk about this a little in the introduction, have been really important to bring light to um, not just the tradition, but also the new poets. Uh, mm -hmm. James Weldon Johnson's famous book of American Negro poetry um, was really, uh, I think it's 1922, um, is really important. And I think it's almost right before the Harlem Renaissance or right in the early midst of it. Mm -hmm. um, but then he does another edition of it in which he includes those younger poets. Um, and he's, in a way, the anthology both kicks off the Renaissance and it then captures it. And one of the things that happened for me uh, in editing the, the book, and you're going to hear from some of the younger generation of poets um, uh, coming up, like Sophia and uh, Amanda, who, who you know has just been tremendous. I was so happy <laughs> for her to see her yes. on that stage yes. and see her bring it. Uh, and yeah. you, you know, we know that tradition of inaugural poets, which in many ways is a black tradition, um, you yes. know, from Maya Angelou to Elizabeth Alexander uh, and now Amanda Gorman. All that's to say, I, I really want to capture this younger generation. Um, um, and uh, Sophia is, is terrific. Um, and to me, that whole generation, you know, and I was a little upset at first, like, wait, I'm not the youngest generation? You know, how'd that happen? <laughs> I, you know, it crept up on, uh, on me, but that's, the yes. same, you know, those yes. poets are so exciting, you know, yeah. in, in a way, that's a whole other anthology that needs to happen is an anthology of these current poets. Um, yeah, but to me, yeah. the anthologies in the 20s and then, you know, there's many more in between, but in the 60s, for instance, things like, I don't know which you read, uh, Black Voices, Black, you know, Poets USA, yes. all those yes. are so exactly. important. Um, to you know, where I encountered first different poets. And Langston Hughes, for instance, who's in the early anthologies is then editing the poetry yes. of the Negro, this colossal volume um, that in many ways for me is an antecedent to this one. Yes. So. That's funny you would say that because I was thinking the same thing about that anthology and this anthology that yeah. they are holding yeah. hands. 
I don't know if you guys can hear me. I'm getting a, a unstable signal. Can you hear me okay, Kevin? Can you hear me fine? Yeah, we can hear you all right. Oh, okay. So um, I was thinking the same thing about this anthology too. I just think anthologies are such, um, I wrote on Instagram, it's just like a time capsule that you you put out into the, the universe for the world to see the, the state and the history. So I'm really grateful. Um, Kevin, uh, what made you agree to do this? It's a, it's a Herculean <laughs> effort. I, I was thinking <laughs> when I was reading it, the first time when I arrived at it, I was like, I was flipping through the pages going, I'm looking at it, it's right here. I was going, no way, dude, no way. <laughs> what made you decide to do oh, this? That's I bet you it's your, big old, your big old lion heart. I bet you that's what it was. What made um, you decide yeah, to do this? It was, uh, you know, it was a, a pleasure to do it. You know, I, I, I think we all as poets uh, carry around an anthology in our heads um, yeah. and in a way to see it in print, um, you know, the hardest thing, frankly, and, and still is, is was cutting it down. You know, yeah. you can't put a yeah. hundred Langston and Hughes poems, even though that's how many <laughs> at least are great, you know, yes. uh, and necessary. Yes. Uh, and so uh, balancing it, but that then by the end became the pleasure of it. So, uh, yeah. It was really a, a labor of love in the end. Yes, it's obvious it was a labor of love. Uh, speaking of 100 Poems of Langston Hughes, I just want to uh, also tell the audience that an anthology for me is also a kind of, um, it's a kind of feast. And then hopefully you will go out and uh, read these poets, it even, you know, uh, their collections and just just research them because the the wormhole the beautiful beautiful black holes and I mean that in the best possible yeah, way yeah, sure. black, a black hole for me is a very black nationalist thing uh, <laughs> you know you can just go off and come back in about yeah, 15 come years back and, clean. You'll, and you yeah. and you you will come back clean and deeply satisfied so yeah. in any case um what any particular uh, moments or poems that overjoyed you gave you deep joy to include. Well, I think it's almost what I was really, I was really um, uh, wanted to have a lot of balance and show the range of, uh, and the depth yeah. of Black poetry, uh, yeah. the plurality of voices, you know, and yeah. uh, there's so many great poets. Um, and what I want to do is include as much of them as I could, of course, but in some cases, you know, including whole epics in there, you know, Middle Passage yes, by yes. Robert Hayden or yes. uh, Long Poems by Baraka and yes. uh, Sonia Sanchez, you know, and, and yes. sometimes you have to excerpt to hint at that, but it shows, yes. I think, what uh, Jessica read from the introduction about the epic quality. Uh, mm -hmm. And to me, it's an epic story, both in miniature and uh, over time, you know, and, yes. you know, starting with Phyllis Wheatley writing in slavery during yes. enslavement uh, yes. and in a coded way about her enslavement. I mean, yeah. the first poem mm -hmm. uh, in the book about imagination is very much uh, a, a poem of liberation and how the power of thought and it has figures of muses and women who are very powerful it's you know couldn't be clearer to us now yeah. um and you know to me that that quality is really important um to capture and so there it was a joy to see uh uh phyllis wheatley and and celebrate her um but it was a joy to discover other poets women poets uh, lgbtq poets um, mm -hmm. Some of whom I knew, of course, but to include them, which I hope are discoveries for people, but also I hope we're reminded of people who, uh, like May Cowdery, who's a Harlem Renaissance yes. poet, that I think is just tremendous, you know. Um, the, some eras were harder to find those discoveries and those joys, as you put it, than others. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the teens was hard sometimes, but so was the 1980s in a weird way. Um, oh, that's and fascinating. So, Why do you think yeah. that was? Well, I think sometimes there was a retrenchment after the publishing boom of the 60s, the publishing mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. boom that, you know, in a way, the new Negro movement that uh, happens before, you know, I, I go at length on this, so please, <laughs> I don't, I don't want to get into my whole intro. Please, um, I can listen to you for hours. Go right uh, ahead, you know, sir. Before the Harlem Renaissance and then after, there's, there's you know, a, a bit of a dearth, you know, uh, and that was really exciting to track down those poets. And it's not a dearth of writing poets. I want to under, make that clear. Poets were writing, and we've been writing since enslavement. Um, but it's the publishing side that uh, sometimes lets the poets down. And that's why I think eventually poets publish themselves and start companies. People start things like Cave Canem, and I was in the Darkroom Collective. And, you know, these were ways to kind of address silences. Uh, and then in the end, I yes. hope there's celebrations. Yes. 
I think it's such a good point you're making about those moments when publishing did not uh, step forward uh, and support black writing and black poets. Uh, because I was recently looking at all the chat books I have from the 80s, all the privately published, self-published mm. collections, yeah. especially by uh, Black queer poets, especially Black queer men who are no longer alive because of the AIDS yes. epidemic. And, and, you know, the significance of their work gets turned up by the historical sure. frame. So yeah. thank you for that. Um, what poems yeah, are you absolutely. most, oh, sorry. What poems are you most proud of including, Kevin? Like, which ones are you like, I'm getting this in no matter what. <laughs> Like I noticed that there was something about Lucille Clifton something poems that I was like, it went by my screen at some point. And oh, I said, I have to ask him about that. The, what, say again? Uh, she, so she, uh, Lucille Clifton is one of my favorites and uh, yes, I'm not too. alone in this. Yes. Um, and, you know, I know we're gonna hear a poem by her uh, later, but you know, like, won't you celebrate with me is just a poem that, you know, uh, changed me and knowing mm -hmm. her changed me quite literally, she picked my first book, but also her, emphasis on what poetry did and does. She used yeah. to say, you know, poetry comforts the afflicted and afflicts the comfortable. And that kind wait, of- Wait, can you say that again and slow down? Say that in slow motion. <laughs> okay, That's brilliant. That's brilliant. Say poetry, say it again. Uh, <laughs> comforts wow. the afflicted and afflicts the comfortable. Uh, wow. And I think that quality of comfort and affliction, struggle and song, if you will, uh, was one yeah. she really captured. But one of the other things she did is she, took down the, and they found them, and I found them in her archive, which I helped, um, you know, get. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. It's currently at Emory University at the Rose Library. Uh, it, uh, you know, going through her papers was just incredible. Um, and she was like 10 feet away staring at me. And um, here, here are her jump rope rhymes that she recorded, you know, uh, and just wrote Oh, come down. on. Yeah, they're amazing. So I put some of those in there. That might be high on my list. That might be the that might be the thing we have to listen to. Remember you were saying before we came on stage that there might be something we need to listen to or look at. Maybe we could look at. I mean, later like for sure. You know, like they're yeah. they're so good. Incredible. Um, you know, they're so and and there are folk poetry, of course. Uh, and yeah. there's other folk poetry that we know gets made into poems, the blues uh, and the sure. oral literature. Sure. Let's call it has been so important to black poetry. Uh, black poetry, yeah. musicians, they write with musicians. We're gonna hear a terrific musician in a moment. Uh, you know, like yes. to me, that connection is rich. Uh, the song part yes. uh, of, yes. of subtitle. So I don't know, her, her, her ability to capture those. And, you know, of course they're often sung by women or young girls. Um, yes. And, you know, I can't double Dutch. I don't know if you, uh, you can or did or, but wait, I did. Hello, I did do double Dutch. What do you mean to tell me that what the jump rope poems are? I haven't looked at them yet. Are uh, lyrical songs from children? Yeah, they're chants. There's a chance that. Oh my God, yeah, I'm yeah, dying. That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah, they're incredible. That's fantastic. I mean, because, right, they talk about, we talk about this with regard to ancient Rome, right? That the children's games that we're starting to uh, recognize in the temples, outside the temples, like little carvings and things, tell us more about Roman ancient history than the architecture, which, you know, everybody, and it, for good reason, celebrates. But the children's games are just- Now you're, you're, you're acting like everyone knows this. You're a brilliant classicist. Uh, no, but I think about this with regard. To, but I think about this with regard to black children's nursery rhymes, and yes. I, did, I didn't know about the jump rope songs. That's incredible. That's incredible. Right, well, that's they're, they're, they're artifacts. They're artifacts. They're artifacts. Well, they're poetry. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, of course. Well, of course. I mean, and what's so great about poetry is it could be many things at once. Sure. Yeah. That's what's so great about poetry. So I, I know we probably have, time have for to. A couple more I know one more question. I, I got it. I got it right here with you. Yeah, you good, girl? I'm just. I'm not. <laughs> I'm just teasing you. You yeah. guys, the audience, if you guys don't know, Kevin and I are dear friends, and so it's really hard not to break into a cousin teasing a moment with him at all times. Uh, Kevin, what was the most complex uh, thing about doing the anthology? For example, I don't know about you, but when I take on a project, I get very obsessed, and so I stay up at night. I think about things. I wonder what about this anthology kept you up at night? Having to cut, you know, having to think about what can't go in and um but also thinking about you know uh not wanting to um yeah. have uh i don't know that's a great question the, the complexity i think was there i think organizing it too was hard to figure out because 
at one point, I don't even remember what the organization is, but now it's, you know, chronological at the beginning through enslavement and then starting with Paul Lawrence Dunbar and his generation, it's alphabetical according to these generations mm -hmm. and there's eight of them in total. And I, I feel like that really helped me see the ways that people were talking to each other. Uh, and of course, mm -hmm. some, you know, uh, Langston Hughes is uh, talking to Gwendolyn Brooks, uh, you know, people are, you know, Langston Hughes publishes into the sick, until he dies in the late 60s. So there's, you know, a long history, but it seemed like the best way to kind of try to capture rather than the whole thing being, say, alphabetical, that sort of progression or rather that conversation. Um, yes. and so that complexity, uh, I want to let stand and let be part of it, you know, and um, that wrapping one's hands around that uh, was hard, but it also required reading as much as I could and then uh, stepping back, uh, you know, because you get, as you kind of indicate, you get kind of uh, micro about it all. And, and the point is the whole thing. Um, and, I, you know, Max knows, I'm like, is it two volumes? Can I have three volumes? You know, I was like, you know, it's so big. Uh, I'm not sure <laughs> the tradition can be even contained. Totally, totally. It's an exciting yes. thing. It, yes. You know, a thousand pages is, is probably is good. And it, it, weirdly, I, I still feel like it's a quick read. It's a quick way to dip in and out and, and to see uh, the state of uh, the union in a way. And I, I, like I said, I want to question Americanness, and there's poets who are uh, Puerto Rican, uh, uh, Afro-Latino, um, that are really, I think, important to the tradition and important to think about the tradition in new ways. And the poets like Les Sanel, who are Creole poets, yes, um, writing yes. in the uh, 1840s. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that's the first anthology of Black poetry. Um, and they're right in French. Yeah, right. That's and right. so we have that's to right. acknowledge these other languages, um, including vernacular English that people are writing in and about. Yeah. Kevin, you know, you talk about the blues often and you write in the blues form sometimes and a lot of black poets have. And I always think about, I remember, you know, I love when you find allies where you least expect them. Uh, Robert Haas, when he did that anthology of Basho has an essay where he's trying to explain to English readers that the absolute that, that you just can't even understand what a real haiku is in Japanese. You just you mm -hmm. never you you will never be able to understand it as American artists. And then he goes, except perhaps if you listen to the blues. Mm. The blues is the closest form to the haiku that's in, a, that I've ever encountered. Well, you know, someone like isn't that, isn't that incredible? Yes. Well, Sister Sonia Sanchez, of course, perfected the blues haiku. Um, yes, and that's another uh, part of the tradition um, that's amazing. Is you know starting in the 20s, there's black poets writing haiku. Um, yes. Quite interestingly, capably, Richard Wright, better known yes. as a novelist, wrote thousands of haiku and we could only include some, but you get a real flavor of this other side of him, uh, which I'll, I argue is a really important side to understand. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, coming up to the present day, uh, that, that form, you know, and Sister Sonia is so smart about it. Uh, we've talked about it before, she and I. Um, and so- What I did she say? Oh, you know, she, it, it was like a hour long conversation, but what she, the, that uh, appeared online, you can find it. But one okay. of the things she did is she talked about, you know, it's the demands of the form, you know, it isn't, e it ain't easy, um, you know, and so <laughs> I, I, the blues aren't either. So I think there's yes. a, a way that it's a demanding form that can yes. seem easier than it is. Um, and, yeah. and, you know, I think there's a powerful yeah. uh, lyric yes. quality that people are, are going. All right, Reginald, we gotta go to your okay. reading. I'll just say, okay, yes, I'll just say one more thing though. Reginald Harris and I, the great poet Reginald Harris and I one had, once had a great conversation because in American poetry, for those in the audience that don't know, there's this myth amongst poets that you either are descended from Walt Whitman or Emily Dickinson, both very extraordinary poems. I, poets, I love them both and I worship at the altar of their work. But, you know, Reginald Harris said, well, my um my direct, I'm a direct descendant of the blues, right? Yeah. What is, you know, Emily and Walt, what, what can they do with the blues anyway? I think about that a lot because the blues uh, has a trace and a ghost and a haunting. And I think that that has so much to do with our tradition, right? That there's so many things happening on the page at once. So many things. Kevin, I don't well, even know what to say to you. I'm sitting here, I'm, I'm sitting here going, <laughs> I just want to sit and listen to him and, and ask questions for hours well, and hours. I, I don't have to wait. It. 
Well, we'll talk. You don't again. have to wait until I come to DC and you get me a free ticket into the no, okay. DC. <laughs> Deal. Thanks everyone for Kevin, listening and, and you know, thank uh, you. For, audience, please join me in thanking Kevin Young for this incredible contribution. Just thanks. a treasure, just a treasure. See ya. Thank you, Kevin. So um, I'm going to, uh, in keeping with the idea of ancestors and elders, I can't see. I hope everyone can see me because I can't see anything. Um, hold on just one sec, you all. Okay, I'm going to uh, read a poem about Lucy Terry Prince. So, you know, always using the uh, reading as a opportunity to call, call out our, our historical ancestors' names, but also um, to honor them. And so Lucy Terry Prince was uh, a write, was a composed a poem at the same time, the same century as Phyllis Wheatley. However, she isn't much celebrated. And here's the thing, she isn't much celebrated because she didn't write her poem down. This is the beginning or uh, kind of one of the uh, branches of the beginning of oral black poetry. So her poem wasn't published for over 100 years, over 100 years after her death, right? And the poem is uh, called The Bars Fight. And I, it was committed to memory for over a century and held in people's hearts and minds. And then, you know, a century later it was published. I, I can't tell you what this woman means to me, but also I think about um, the history of this poem as really uh, kind of capsulizing the history of blackness, right? Like we often think we need, um, well, I'm not saying we black people, but I'm just saying, uh, the ways in which we think about poetry, the ways in which we think about literature, that we need a press, that we need a this, that we need a that, that we need an institution, we need institutional support. And that's all true. Uh, but Lucy Terry Prince's poem proves to me that we have everything we need right inside, right? And it's a very, to me, the history of that poem is a very black history because it survived without a press at all. Um, and so uh, the other thing that's interesting to me about this poem that people don't talk about is actually the poem, it's titled Bars Fight. It is a documentary poem that uh, discusses the rebellion of First Nation, a First Nation tribe in New England against colonial settlers. The Bars Fight was a, a moment in history where uh, there was a uh, insurrection where the First Nation folk actually won. You know, we rarely so often hear about slave revolts, about indigenous revolts, where uh, the resistance was successful. So for me, that poem is very precious to me for that reason as well. Again, a poem can be many things. It's an artifact and it's a lyric. Um, and so I've written several poems for Lucy Terry Prince and the one that's in the anthology is called Lucy Terry Prince Prepares for Her Marriage. I want to just tell you a little bit about why this is important, why this was important for me to write. Um, so as I said, the poem wasn't uh, committed to paper or published for over a century. Um, I'm trying to figure out if I have to tell you anything else. And, uh, and so you should also think about the economy of paper for writers and the economy of ink and pencils. Those things were hard to come by, but uh, she also got married during this time. And there's a great historian named Gretchen Holbrook Gerzina. And because our archives are so full of holes, uh, historians have gotten very creative to find, find our histories in different ways. And so Gerzina decided to, uh, came across the inventory of the grocery store from the 1750s and to track Lucy Terry Prince's purchases over a year. And this was the year that she was preparing for her wedding. And so this poem is an erasure of the inventory from the grocery store from 1750s of Lucy Terry Prince. Lucy Terry Prince prepares for her marriage. First a fan, then some pins and chocolate. Later, five yards of checkered cloth, cambric. Later still, seven shillings of imported linen more cambric, ribbons, a double-stranded white necklace, more ribbon, a string of beads, a skein of silk thread, thimble, mug, buttons, five yards of galoon, silver or gold trimming, and then in 1751, three sheets 
of paper. And then in closing, I'm gonna read one of my favorite poems of all time by one of my favorite poets of all time. Um, before I do, I wanna say I'm dedicating this poem, just as Kevin said, to the new generations of poets coming up and also to all of the people who have gotten the streets this year, the years of 2020, and, um, and showed us their huge, huge, huge bonfires of their hearts. So this is a great poem by Gwendolyn Brooks. It's called The Second Sermon on the War Plan, and I wanna dedicate it to all the youth out there. One, this is the urgency, live, and have your blooming in the noise of the whirlwind. To sal savage in the spin, endorse the squinder splashes, stylize the flawed utility, prop on the line of failing light, but know the whirlwind is our commonwealth. Not the easy man who rides above them all, not the jumbo brigand, not the pet bird of poets, that sweetest sonnet shall straddle the whirlwind. Nevertheless, live. Three. All about the cold places, all about are the pushmen and jeopardy, theft, all about are the stormers and scramblers, but what must our season be? Which starts from fear? Live and go out, define and medicate the whirlwind. Four, the time cracks into furious flower, lifts its face all unashamed and sways in wicked grace whose half black hands assemble oranges is, is Tom Tom hearted, goes in bearing oranges and boom. And there are bells for orphans and red and shriek and sheen. A garbage man is dignified as any diplomat. Big Bessie's feet hurt like nobody's business, but she stands bigly under the unruly scrutiny, stands in the wild weed, in the wild weed. She is a citizen and is a moment of highest quality, admirable. It is loathsome, sorry, it is lonesome, yes, for we are the last of the loud. Nevertheless, live, conduct your blooming in the noise and whip of the whirlwind. Thank you so much. I'm so honored to be here with you all today. Sorry about that. <laughs> hey there, everybody. My name is Chris Bowers, and um, I'm a composer and pianist. Um, and uh, today I'm going to read a Langston Hughes uh, poem. And um, you know, it's it's funny because I came, I became a musician, so I really didn't have to speak. <laughs> and uh, but at the same time, it's really an honor to be a part of this. You know, as a, a film composer, I really found myself drawn to the ability to tell stories with music and and um you know early on i remember um uh, watching films and then listening to the scores afterward and then being able to feel the same emotions that i felt in the film just listening to the music and so that really connected me to the the narrative power of music and um like kevin and robin said earlier i feel like there's such a thin line between um music and poetry and so uh, it's really an honor to be a part of this so this is um Langston hughes's let America be America again. And uh, just like Robin was saying about the piece you just read, I felt like this spoke to me not only because of the piece I'll be playing on piano for you, but also just given the last year and, and um, what we've seen from our, uh, our generation. So let America be America again. Let America be America again. Let it be the dream it used to be. Let it be the pioneer on the plane, seeking a home where he himself is free. America never was America to me. Let America be the dream the dreamers dreamed. Let it be the great strong land of love where never kings connive nor tyrants scheme that any man be crushed by one above. It never was America to me. Oh, let my land be a land where liberty is crowned with no false patriotic wreath, but opportunity is real and life is free. Equality is in the air we breathe. There's never been equality for me nor freedom in this homeland of the free. Say, who are you that mumbles in the dark? 
And who are you that draws your veil across the stars? I am the poor white fooled and pushed apart. I am the Negro bearing slavery scars. I am the red man driven from the land. I am the immigrant clutching hope I seek and finding only the same old stupid plan of dog eat dog of mighty crush the weak. I'm the young man full of strength and hope, tangled in that ancient endless chain of profit power gain of grab the land, of grab the gold, of grab the ways of satisfying need, of work the men, of take the pay, of owning everything of one's own greed. I'm the farmer, bondsman to the soil. I'm the worker sold to the machine. I'm the Negro servant to you all. I'm the people, humble, hungry, mean, hungry yet today despite the dream, beaten yet today, oh pioneers, I'm the man who never got ahead, the poorest worker bartered through the years. Yet I'm the one who dreamt of our basic dream. In the old world, while still a surf of kings, who dreamt, of, who dreamt a dream so strong, so brave, so true, that even yet its mighty daring sings in every brick and stone and every furrow turned that's made America the land it has become. Oh, I'm the man who sailed those early seas in search of what I meant to be, to be my home. For I'm the one who left dark Ireland's shores and Poland's plain and England's grassy lee. And torn from black Africa's strand, I came to build a homeland of the free. The free? Who said the free? Not me, surely not me. The millions on relief today? The millions shot down when we strike? The millions who have nothing for our pay? for all the dreams we've dreamed and all the songs we've sung and all the hopes we've held and all the flags we've hung, the millions who have nothing for our pay except the dream that's almost dead today. Oh, let America be America again, the land that never has been yet and yet must be, the land where every man is free, the land that's mine, the poor man's, Indians, Negroes, me, who made America, whose sweat and blood, whose faith and pain, whose hand at the foundry, whose plow in the rain, must bring back our mighty dream again. Sure, call me an ugly name you choose. The steel of freedom does not stain. From those who live like leeches on the people's lives, we must take back our land again, America. Oh yes, I say it plain, America never was America to me. And yet I swear this oath, America will be. Out of the rack and ruin of our gangster death, the rape and rot of graft and stealth and lies, we the people must redeem the land, the mines, the plant, the rivers, the mountains and the endless plain, all, all the stretch of these great green states and make America again. Um, <clears throat> so I, I chose that piece also uh, because as I said, it, it really feels like it reflects uh, the piece of music I'm, I'm about to play for you all. Uh, this piece is called Hope. And it's something that I wrote, um, actually, maybe, I can't even do the math now, but when I was about 18 or 19, um, and it was when uh, I voted for Barack Obama in his first, uh, his first run for president. And I turned 18, and that was my first experience voting. And I was just so moved and felt so honored to be a part of this experience in my first vote. Um, and I, I hadn't really played the piece in a while, and I started playing it again in the last few years. And it just took on a completely different sound and shape for me um, during the, the, the last administration that we just had. Um, and, uh, and then now, where we are now, um, it's again taken a different form and a different shape and meaning for me. And so it's one of the few pieces that I play um, that I've written before, and, and uh, I hope you guys enjoy it. This is called Hope.
Thanks for listening. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm so thrilled to be here, and it, it's such an honor to be included in this anthology with so many ancestors without whom my work wouldn't exist. Um, I'll be reading a poem from one of those ancestors, one of my favorite poets, Lucille Clifton, um, who is not only a poet on my family tree, but is also the roots and the rain and the sunshine on this family tree. And um, one of the things that I admire most about Lucille Clifton's work is how much she can pack a deep cosmos of knowledge in such a small space on the page. Um, and as I was going through this anthology, there were so many poems of hers that I love, including, you know, Won't You Celebrate With Me? But there was one that I kept coming back to, this one that I'll be reading called Study the Masters, that I think so perfectly speaks to our current moment. Um, which is such a nimble critique of mastery, this idea of who gets to be called master, whose knowledge is privileged, whose life gets to be elevated in art and literature. And in this poem, we see how Clifton so deftly shows us that, um, that there is art and beauty in domestic spaces, particularly in the spaces that Black women inhabit, and that, that there is a deep knowledge in these spaces, and that their lives and labor too deserve to be lifted up in songs and in poems. This is Study the Masters. Study the Masters like my aunt Timmy. It was her iron or one like hers that smoothed the sheets the master poet slept on. Home or hotel, what matters is he lay himself down on her handiwork and dreamed. She dreamed too. Words, some Cherokee, some Maasai, and some huge and particular as hope. If you had heard her ch chanting as she ironed, you would understand form and line and discipline and order and America. Next, I'll be reading one of my own poems um, called Double America, uh, which was written a couple years ago, but it couldn't have, could have been written a couple months ago, um, the way that the history of this country seems to be quite recursive. Um, it is an ekphrastic poem based on a Glen Ligon piece of the same name. Um, it's also a palindrome, so the poem reads the same way forwards and backwards. It begins with an epigraph from Aimé Césaire. Double America. The hour of the barbarian is at hand. The modern barbarian, the American hour. Aimé Césaire, Discourse on Colonialism. Every black life goes the way of the bison eventually. Forgotten, bone threaded to earth, a gash of weeds goring yellow through my brother's skull. In the desert, buck full with your good lead, the last bald eagle rakes his clipped invisible wings down the parched highway where a river used to be. My father fretful dying because he was hungry, you and you daily, weekly pass his living body cold in the street. Here, invisible is a way of being. My mother, quiet, sweeping inside your mansions. My mother, sullen, dreaming of a nation that might someday dream me. 
America. I am poor in all ways, fixed and unfixable. My poverty, a bullet point and a bullet hole. Endangered, my body soars, its dark, unseemly flare across these decades, shot through with blues. My sister and I chained face to face, pleading, look at me. Am I a woman's rights, America? I am a woman's rights, America, chained face to face, my sister and I pleading. Look at me, unseemly flare across these decades, shot through with blues and a bullet hole. Endangered, my body soars, its dark ways fixed and unfixable. My poverty, a bullet point that might someday dream me. America, I am poor in all your mansions, my mother sullen, Dreaming of a nation is a way of being, my mother quiet, sweeping inside, past his living body cold in the street, hair invisible because he was hungry. You and you, daily, weekly, where a river used to be, my father fretful, dying his clipped invisible wings down a parched highway buck full with your good lead the last bald eagle rakes goring yellow through my brother's skull in the desert forgotten bone threaded to earth a gash of weeds every black life goes the way of the bison eventually. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Amanda Gorman, and I'm the inaugural poet. I'm really excited to be here in celebration of Lift Every Voice. For me, the Los Angeles Public Library has had such a pivotal role in my life, in my discovery of poetry. For one, it was at the library's Mark Taper Auditorium downtown in which I was first named the inaugural Los Angeles Youth Poet Laureate. Even during COVID when so many libraries have been shut down, um, the Central Library was gracious enough for me to come in and let me film a poem called The Miracle of Morning um, as a type of commentary on the pandemic. As well, the Library Foundation has been basically an extension of my family for me. Um, they've been in my life for years now, before I was United States Youth Poet Laureate, before I was well known. And, um, you know, my mom has met the staff, my sister has met some staff members. And so um, for me, this is really a homecoming. And I am so honored and thrilled to be here, albeit virtually, alongside some of, you know, my heroes in the arts, whether it be Kevin, Chris, Robin, Safia, you all are just, you know, the pinnacles of your craft. And so I am so just touched to be here. I'm going to be reading two poems, one of which is from the anthology and the other is one of my own poems. I thought I would begin with the poem in the anthology. And so, you know, I'm reading The Negro Speaks of Rivers by Langston Hughes. The reason I'm reading this, although it's a bit short, is because I remember distinctly reading it for the first time, I want to say in elementary school, and it was really my first foray into African American literature. I want to say one of the first poems by a Black author that I'd read. And so for me, it has a very kind of sentimental place in just my own self-discovery as a writer. And I think beyond that, um, it's just such a lush, beautiful, poem, you know, just so economically smart. And so I thought I'd begin with that. The Negro Speaks of Rivers. I've known rivers. I've known rivers ancient as the world and older than the flow of human blood in human veins. My soul has grown deep like the rivers. I bathed in the Euphrates when dawns were young. 
I built my hut near the Congo and it lulled me to sleep. I looked upon the Nile and raised pyramids above it. I heard the singing of the Mississippi when Abe Lincoln went down to New Orleans. I've seen its muddy bosom turn all golden in the sunset. I've known rivers, ancient, dusky rivers. My soul has grown deep like the rivers. Thank you. That is my first poem. Again, like I said, it's just so beautiful, so gorgeous. You know, it is a bit concise, but for me, I love the play of imagery, um, the use of water and rivers, which in, you know, Black folklore, Black song, Negro spirituals has such a central place. The next poem I'm going to read actually has a connection to one of our panelists for this event, Kevin Young. Um, this poem I wrote as a coda to Black History Month for the New York Times, I wanna say two or three years ago. And for me, I was struggling really um, difficultly to find an approach to writing this poem. I just felt like it was so challenging to try to say something new about race 250 years in. And instead of trying to kind of force myself to superficially say something new, um, I invited myself to repeat and embody something very old. And so what I did is I um, went to, I didn't physically go, but I looked at um, the exhibitions and the digital archival materials of the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture, which Kevin is the director of, phenomenal job. And I looked at kind of the images of protest banners, flyers, pins, um, any type of text that was used in the civil rights movement. Um, looking at um, even shirts that were worn, just anything that had words and language. And I wrote all of them down and basically collaged this poem. And so the rules that I set for myself was I wasn't going to take a statement that I saw um, in you know these archives and like really taint it and break it up. Meaning if the phrase was something like, um, I'm trying to think of one from the poem. One of them is, let's just say the title, Old Jim Crow Got to Go. I can't take go out of there and just put it randomly in a new place. It has to stay as a unit of sound as it appeared in that pin or on that flyer. So really trying to preserve the units of meaning from those original source materials, but weave them and collage them in a way in which hopefully they embody something kind of new sonically. So this poem, like I said, is taken from all of those materials, not only from the civil rights movement, I should say, I looked a bit to slavery and even wanted posters as well. I looked also as well to the role of black women um, in the women's rights movement, um, which isn't highlighted enough, black women, I should say, um, in that kind of intersectionality of that movement. And so you're going to hear a lot of text from multiple sides of social justice organizing and even the words and the rhetoric that was used against African Americans through slavery and kind of through those time periods. This is called Old Jim Crow Got to Go. Whose face is white as snow, everywhere a daisy goes, no dogs, no Negro, I am a man. I am the way I am, I look the way I look, I am my age. I am a man. Black Power core. Malcolm X speaks for me. He died to make men free. Malcolm's legacy, one man, one vote. SNCC, don't you want to be free? I'm for King's Way, watch your backs, kill all blacks. Run King out of Alabama, cooking and smoking. Where we at, black males and endangered species. A perspective on solidarity, black, is beautiful, free, Angela Davis. Now liberation in the making, Angela is free, free all political prisoners, 50% black woman artist, revolutionary hope, Shirley Chisholm. Unbiased and unbought, anatomy of the black aesthetic, an examination, Nikki Giovanni, critic, go home, Harriet Tubman, home. She allegedly has purchased several guns in the past, considered possibly armed and dangerous. Small scars on both knees, eyes brown, race 
Negro, nationality, American. What are girls made of? Catalyst for change, I believe, in Nita Hill, age 26, height 5'8", hair black, occupation teacher. Woman, free our sisters, what can a girl do? What have women done? What can you do? End racism and repression. Testimony from a black sister marks the beginning of a new era in the minds, in the hearts, in the lives of all black men and women. Get it? Together. We march with Selma. The moonwalk won't be as bad as our walk. Move on over or we'll move on over you. Lifting as we climb, we shall overcome freedom, ride, core. Keep us flying, keep us flying. Don't you want to be free? Liberty and equality, they shall not die. Thank you so much for listening to my two poems I read today. Like I said, it's just been such an honor for me to be part of this event, even in all this kind of um, craziness of COVID and things like that. Um, the Library Foundation, the Los Angeles Public Library has been have been such great patrons and supporters of me. And like I said, the other artists who are here today virtually are just phenomenal. So thank you for listening. And I'm really looking forward to reading this anthology in full. Have a good one. Bye. Thank you all so much for being here. Sorry about that. Um, I'm I'm blown away by this evening. Uh, I, I, um, I, I have no words, but to thank all our extraordinary guests for such an incredible night. And for more information about future programs, please visit lfla.org. And thank you all for joining us uh, here at the Library Foundation. I, um, I wish you all a good evening and good night. Thank you.